Last year, I made a video titled The Man Quietly Destroying the Mavericks Franchise. And obviously that man was Mark Cuban. At the time of me making that video, the Dallas Mavericks, after staying around the third, fourth seed for the majority of the first half of the season, winded up not even making the play-in. Mind you, this happened despite them making what looked to be the most desperate move all of last year, trading for Kyrie Irving at the trade deadline. Now, what made that move look so desperate is because, well, Kyrie Irving didn't have the best reputation at that point, and he was essentially a free agent in that following offseason. Obviously, it's laughable in 2020 hindsight, but at that moment, the Mavericks had the risk losing Dorian Finney-Smith, Spencer Dinwiddie, and a first-round pick for like 20-ish games of Kyrie Irving. What made them, and specifically Mark Cuban, look even worse is the evolution of the player they just fumbled in the previous offseason, Jalen Brunson. Now, we see Jalen now and what he ultimately became with New York. And historically, that would have been one of the worst fumbles ever had they not landed and kept Kyrie. Jalen Brunson right now is easily, easily, not even close, on the best contract in the sport. In these playoffs, we literally just witnessed it, but in these playoffs, Jalen Brunson just averaged 32 points a night in 13 games. Since the 2010s, these are the most points scored a night by a player that at least made it to the second round. Jalen is fifth. This man is on this list and he just had this run. And this year he was the 52nd highest paid player in the sport. That, that is insane. What makes Mark look even worse prior to the Kyrie trade is the contract he's on right now in New York. This good ass contract literally could have been sliced in half had he stayed in Dallas. Mark Cuban didn't even want to pay him basically half of what he's making right now in New York. And that would have made him around the 110th highest paid player in the sport. Yes, it was literally that bad. And yes, it looked terrible. But sometimes in sports, you really just have to get lucky. And now landing the mature vet version of Kyrie that literally lost nothing after what you just fumbled with Jalen, it doesn't get much luckier than that. Today's video is sponsored by Manscaped. Father's Day is coming up. And if you find yourself scrambling for pops, Manscaped, they have everything he needs. Today, I wanna to put you guys onto the Handyman, which to me is one of the slickest, most convenient shavers on the market. The Handyman features a standard foil shaver, as well as a long hair leveler blade to knock down like three days worth of growth. This thing is powerful. It also has skin safe technology, so you don't have to worry about those annoying nicks and cuts, and it's waterproof. You can rinse it off in the sink with no problems. Also, I wanna talk about their Weed Whacker 2.0. This is for those nose and ear hairs that's probably making you sneeze. With a 7,000 RPM motor and a 360 degree rotary dual blade system, this would tackle all of that with no problems. If you don't wanna be born and get Pops a t-shirt, a coffee mug, a gift card like you did last year, get him something that he'll actually use. Head over to manscaped.com and get 20% off plus free international shipping with my promo code SWISH. That's 20% off plus free international shipping with my promo code SWISH only at manscaped.com. The Dallas Mavericks, barring an epic all-time collapse, they're back in the NBA Finals. And the story of this team, not even just because of Kyrie, is a lot more special than you probably even realize. But starting with Kyrie, the entire NBA, they, they do owe this man an apology. Not saying Kyrie's been perfect because he hasn't. Anybody saying he has, they're a stand. But the criticism for this man to me has been harsh and his character, in my opinion, was always a little bit nitpicked. First of all, certain things he stood for was absolutely right, especially one specific thing. We don't even have to get too deep into it, but in 2020 hindsight, it looks like Kyrie was basically right. And to be fair, and to add the other side, yes, Kyrie's try stuff that absolutely didn't work. He's even admitted through maturity and age, he learned how to become a better pro and a much better leader. And you're seeing it now. Leaving LeBron, going to Boston, and trying to be the number one option, you commend his confidence, but let's be honest, it absolutely didn't work. Left extremely ugly, and five years later, it's producing one of the best storylines of a finals that I've ever seen. I can't wait. Joining a fragile, desperate franchise like Brooklyn, who essentially gave Kyrie and Kevin Durant all the power, it didn't work. To me, that situation and the Clippers situation with Kawhi, it shows why you can't give a player everything, because soon enough, it will become a clown show. You need some type of structure. The Brooklyn Kyrie homecoming stuff, it didn't work. And you can blame both sides on certain stuff, but not just Kyrie, because I believe 
Josiah, he didn't handle the last situation how he should have. It, it was a little excessive in my opinion. So yes, we know Kyrie's been through a lot, good and bad. He won a championship at like 22 and hit that crazy shot. He's been through a lot. But all of that, all of that bunched in one has produced the guy, the leader that we see now, a major piece to the Dallas Mavericks making the finals. Last year, he landed in Dallas beside Luka Doncic. And anybody who closely watched the collapse of the Mavericks last season, they knew it, it was never Kyrie's fault, ever. What he was brought there to do, he absolutely did. In his 20 games there, yeah, they was eight and 12, four games below 500, but he averaged 27 points per game, crazy high efficiencies, career high in field goal percentage in that little stint, led the fourth quarter in points per game. Yeah, you couldn't ask Kyrie to do more. It had nothing to do with his production. The team, they already had major holes way before they even got Kyrie. And trading for Kyrie obviously is worth it now, but it created even more problems within their depth. When Dallas got Kyrie, they instantly became the second most efficient team in the NBA. But defensively, they were absolutely abysmal. That team, the 2023 Mavericks, they had the perfect recipe for a fancy, fun-ass team to watch because they go and put on the show, but an absolute disaster. Couldn't stop anybody, so they needed Kyrie and Luka to basically outscore everybody to even get a win and couldn't grab a rebound to save their lives. Last season, Dallas, they had the worst rebound differential in the league, but not only just that, they had the worst rebound differential by any team in the last four seasons up to that point. I remember I put this in that Mark Cuban video last year. Look at the teams with the worst rebound differential up to that point over the years and look at their record. Again, it's an absolute recipe for a disaster. Trading for Kyrie solely was never going to fix that. I don't care if he averaged 35 points a game. Look at the Phoenix Suns this year. They got all those quote unquote all-stars, but they had a minus 16 rebound differential in the playoffs. They got swept. But then this offseason and even through this year's trade deadline, I want you to pay close attention to how those little subtle moves pay dividends in the end. Last season, post the Kyrie trade, they struggled before that, but definitely after. They didn't even have one player, not named Luka Doncic, averaging over five rebounds a game. He's not even a big, bro. He's just a great rebounder for his size. This season, they have three, and all three of them are the three big pieces they got within the last 10 months. The rookie they got, Derek Lively, he was just a perfect pickup for Dallas. And to me, he was a clear example of how sometimes drafting for fit, him and Brandon Miller, drafting for fit can be beneficial. I'm sorry, Golden State, it just didn't work out when y'all had that second pick, it just didn't. Derek Lively, in my opinion, has easily been the steal of the draft. And one of the main reasons they rebound now is because he and Daniel Gafford, one of their mid-season additions, they have size, they alter shots, and they clean the glass. They didn't have that last year. Derek Lively unfortunately lost his mom, rest in peace, and he split minutes with Daniel Gafford, so he didn't really get to play as much as he will in the future. But amongst players that played around the minutes he played, under 24 minutes a night just about, he was fourth in plus minus, he was first in field goal percentage, we know why, and he was third in rebounds, and I believe like second in blocks. These playoffs, if you want to see how impactful he is and how crucial he is for that team, I hope he can come back in a timely manner because that shot to the head was pretty hard. But in these playoffs, he has the second highest plus minus by a rookie ever and first on the Dallas Mavericks whole team. Manu Ginobili played nine more games. If they win, and mind you, I'm picking them to win, spoiler alert, but if they win, he's likely going to pass that. And not even just Derek Lively, the other two additions, Daniel Gafford and PJ Washington. PJ Washington was huge in the first two series, literally felt like he couldn't miss. And since they got these two, Daniel Gafford and PJ Washington, they've been a top five defense in the NBA. This specific five man lineup has literally been the best in the league and the dynamic of their offense, it's really changed. One of my favorite advanced stats, not even close, like it's probably my favorite, is usage percentage, tracking how much a player actually has the ball. Kobe Bryant, one of the most ball dominant players to ever play the game. He infamously talked about James Harden in 2019 when he was on that crazy 30 game streak and how that style will never win a championship. I made videos about that. Ultimately, his main point, and obviously he knows he's been through it before, is there's way too many defensive eyes set on one target who mainly dominates the ball and makes all the decisions. Ball movement and some type of fluidity within an offense is very imperative for postseason success. And honestly, if you look at the highest usage percentage players in a single postseason run, 
they normally all in an early defeat. They don't they don't really have long runs. These are actually the highest usage percentage players to ever win a championship. And most of them are held by Michael Jordan, probably the greatest player to ever play. Even Kobe being Brian himself, he didn't really win with an extremely high percentile. That's relatively low for his play style. Look at even the top five players this year. And trust me, I'm going somewhere with this. Brunson, he eventually burnt out and he got hurt. It was fun, but he got hurt. Embiid, he was hurt and he got bounced out in the first round. Donovan Mitchell, he got hurt. Paolo, he lost in the first round. Shea, he was literally by himself in that second round versus Dallas. That style doesn't work. Luka Doncic in his previous playoffs, outside of this year, obviously, he's never had a playoffs where he hasn't led the playoffs in usage percentage. He's never had that. Literally two of the highest percentiles ever as far as how long you hold the ball is held by Luka Doncic. That's how much this man actually had to dominate the Rock in the past. Even in 2022 when they made the conference finals, he had a percentile of 40, I believe the second or third highest ever. This year he's at 31. That is extremely low of a player of Luka's caliber and we know how he's played in the past. Kobe was right. Even his numbers in these playoffs, they're not terrible, but they're by far the worst of any playoff run he's ever had. And now with the trust he has within his new teammates, that's somehow become a positive. And going back to Kyrie Irving and how ideal that signing truly was, we know Luka, he's a closer. Like he's proven it this year, he's proven it in the past. Luka Doncic is possibly the best closer in the NBA. But now you might have the second or who knows, even the first best right beside him. And that doesn't even feel fair. Kyrie, we know he's always been clutch. Hit arguably the greatest shot in NBA history. Last year again, led the fourth quarter in points per game. But this year, if you notice in the conference finals, all the games, they've been extremely tight. You can even argue that all around talent with Anthony Edwards, the emergent possibly face of the NBA, Rudy Gobert, the defensive player of the year, Nas Reed, Cat, he's an all-star. You could argue they have the better all around team. But Dallas, they, they just have those dudes, bro. They just have those dudes. One team has damn near two players averaging double figures in the fourth quarter, and the other team has their two highest players averaging five. Going back to the little subtle moves they made, you know how last year I said they got out-rebounded by like the most in like four or five years? Well, in these playoffs, they out-rebounded every single team they played, every single one, even Minnesota, who's a very great rebounding team. Quick comparison, because this team kind of reminds me of the 2018 Rockets and a little bit of the 2016 Cavs. Obviously, nobody's LeBron. Like, he's a physical specimen on both sides like no other, so nobody had that. But the Cavs, they shot a lot of threes. They were a top rebounding team with Tristan Thompson and Kevin Love. They defended very well, and they had two of the best offensive weapon shot creators in the sport. Houston, they had the same thing, but Chris Paul didn't stay healthy, so we don't know what they could have become. If you guys like this video, make sure you like this video. I picked Dallas to beat Minnesota. I didn't say it in the video, but I did tweet it. And just like I thought Ant was going to have too much on his plate, and he kind of does. Still had a great playoff run and all that. Uh, follow my social media sites for all my live reactions. Turn on post notifications. Do all that great stuff, guys. And until next time, as always, stay tuned.